Jesus tells the disciples in verse 7 that it was not their business to know the exact time. And in Acts 5, and in verse 5, even when he knows that the Holy Spirit will descend in 10 days, he doesn't tell them the exact number of days. He says, you will receive power, you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And of course, it was 10 days later. We're talking about this great verse 8, which outlines the whole book of Acts and which is so important. It shows a progression beginning in Jerusalem. Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. Now, this is both a prophecy and a promise. And let me just tell you that every Christian is a witness. You're a witness whether you want to be or not. You're either a good witness or a bad witness. The Greek word is martus. The plural of martus in Greek is martyres. We get the English word martyr from this word witness. It doesn't mean that to be a good witness we have to die. It does mean that to be a good witness we have to speak of one who has died, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not witnesses for our local church. We are not witnesses for our denomination. We are not witnesses to our particular doctrinal point of view. We're not witnesses for Protestantism or Catholicism or Orthodoxy. We're not, we're not even, strictly speaking, witnesses for Christianity. We are witnesses for a person. We're witnesses to a person, Christ Himself. When Christ says, you shall be my witnesses, that means we are either witnesses who belong to Christ or witnesses for Christ. Um, Jesus does uh, prophesy the, the, the prospect of Israel's redemption. Uh, something great will happen. It will happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. I will not tell you when the kingdom will be established, but I will tell you how the kingdom will be established. It will be established when power from the Holy Spirit comes upon you in such a way that you're my witnesses starting here and going to the whole world. Um, we, we see this great, great promise which starts with a few men and, and extends through the whole earth. Um, the power that is promised is a spiritual power. It's not a physical power. It's not a political power. It's not a personal power. It's not a financial power. It's not an organizational power. It's a spiritual power. I'll tell you something that we will uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later, but I'll I'll tell you now. Um, I don't know if this story is is true. Um, you realize that a little bit later in the book of Acts, there's a lame man who's begging at the temple. And he's expecting money. And Peter and John look at him, and Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up. And he stands up. Peter says, I don't have silver or gold but I can tell you to stand up. Well, there's a story that in the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas was walking in Rome with a cardinal of the church. Thomas Aquinas died in 1275 AD. And the cardinal of the church was looking at all the beauty and all the wealth of, of, Rome, of the Roman church. And he said, uh, Brother Thomas, we can no longer say silver and gold have we none. And Thomas Aquinas answered and said, yes, but we can also no longer say stand up and walk. See, the question is what kind of power do, do we want? What kind of, of power are, are we after? 
power from the Holy Spirit. The power is a holy power. The Holy Spirit has des descended on the Lord Jesus Christ after His baptism like a dove. Remember when the earth was purged of wicked people during the flood. And remember when the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat there in Genesis 8 and 9. And as the waters receded and Noah was trying to ascertain whether it was safe to leave the ark and whether you could live on the earth or not, and he would release the different kinds of birds and the dove was looking for a place, a clean place where she might live because she was a clean bird. And as the, as the earth emerged from the flood, just still dripping and trying to dry off, the, the dove found a place where she could live. Well, as the Lord Jesus Christ emerged from the water of, of the River Jordan after His baptism, the dove of the Holy Spirit found a place where the Holy Spirit could live and stay because this man was clean, this man was pure. And Christ has died that we might be clean and pure, that we might be washed in His blood, that the Holy Spirit, who is Himself perfectly pure, as, because He is the Holy Spirit, might be able to live in our lives without being offended by our sin. And this is the part of the power that the Holy Spirit gives us because we can't be clean and we can't be holy without the, the Spirit's power. But the power is not just to make us clean. The power is to make us fruitful and to make us productive. That is to make us into an effective witness who makes a difference in the place we live, our Jerusalem, and in the places we go to, our Judea, our Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world, where, wherever that will be for us. And so Jesus is telling them what's about to happen. It says in verse 9 that when He said these things, He was lifted up. This is what we call, um, this is what we call the ascension. He was lifted up from the place that He told us to subdue with His message and His power. He leaves the earth, but He leaves His work on the earth to us. Now, I want to talk a minute before we leave this passage. I want to talk a minute about the way this commission, the way this charge sounded to uh, a Jew. When you begin the book of Genesis, God makes everything. His creative power makes everything. When you begin the book of Acts, God's redemptive power is extended over everything that He made. The great emphasis of the Old Testament is creation. The great emphasis of the New Testament is redemption. God didn't make anything that was not ruined by sin and by the fall. But there was nothing which was ruined or sinned by the fall that God did not purpose to redeem through the death and resurrection of His Son and through the preaching of the message of the death and the resurrection of His Son. But to a Jew, the idea that Gentiles are going to be brought into the family was horrifying. Because the great thing to the Jew was not just that God is going to save us, but the great thing is that God is going to save us, but not them. That's what made, Christ that's what made salvation so special. We have a saying in English, we for and no more. And this idea that salvation was to be not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but also in Samaria, whom they hated, and also in the uttermost part of the world was a, a horrifying thing, a, a, a terrible thing. Now, um, let me just show you a few verses. Look at John chapter 4. 
John chapter 4, verse 9. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, Jesus has shown all along that this was his purpose. All along. He never hid it. As a matter of fact, we actually see it in the very verse, first chapter of the New Testament. Remember yesterday I asked you the question, who is the first woman named in the New Testament? When we were studying Genesis 38, maybe it was the day before yesterday. And when we look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, one thing that stands out is the women. Not just the fact that women are named, but the, the question arises, why were these women named? Matthew shares, um, I think, 52 generations in the genealogy of Matthew 1. Uh, three sets of 14 between uh, Abraham and David and between David and the deportation of Babylon and between the deportation of Babylon to the birth of Jesus. 14. No, it's got to be more than 14. Anyway, that would, that would only be 42. Maybe 42 generations. I'll add it up during the break. But anyway, um, he doesn't name a woman in every generation. And he doesn't name famous women. He doesn't name Sarah. He doesn't name Rebecca. He doesn't name Leah. He does, however, name Tamar in verse 3. He does, however, name Ruth. He does, however, mention the woman who had been the wife of Uriah. Now, I have heard this taught in many ways. For instance, I've heard it taught that Matthew does this to show grace, to show God's great grace, because these women all had something wrong with them. Tamar uh, and Bathsheba were immoral, and Ruth was a member of a cursed race, the race of the Moabites. And there may be something to that, but that's not the main point. The main point is that the women are Gentiles. Tamar is a Gentile, and Ruth is a Gentile. And you notice Bathsheba is not named. Her husband is named, the one who had been the wife of Uriah, and Uriah was a Gentile. What Matthew is saying is that Gentiles are playing a role all along. David had two Gentile grandmothers. Tamar and Ruth. It has always been a part of God's plan to include the Gentiles. Now, when you get to John 3, Jesus talks to this great high man called Nicodemus. He's the great hero among the Jews. This man had every advantage of birth. And what does Jesus say to him? Well, you know, there's only one thing you need. You need another birth. That's a shocking thing. This man was high born among the Jews. He was rich. He was politically well connected. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. He was a great teacher. He was a member of the political elite, the Sanhedrin. He was a member of the spiritual elite, the Pharisees. He was a Jew of the Jews. So what does Jesus say? Oh, that birth you have among the Jews, that's not going to be enough. You need another birth. Can you imagine how, much, how shocked he was? Then in John 4, Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman. She's the lowest of the low. She's even rejected among the Gentiles. She's even rejected among the Samaritans. Why? Because she's at the well at 12 noon. Women don't go to the well at 12 noon. And she's at the well alone. Women don't go to the well alone. Why? Why is she there alone at 12 noon? Because the women didn't want to be with her. Why? Because she'd been married five times. And she was now living with a man she wasn't married to. So the Jews rejected the Samaritans, and the Samaritans rejected this woman. She was the lowest of the low. So what does Jesus say to her? What are the first words he says to her? 
the Jews would not go through Samaria because the shadow of a Samaritan meant that a Jew had to take a bath. So what, is, what does Jesus say to her in John 4? He says, I would like to share a drink from your cup. Could we share that cup? Nicodemus had all the advantages of physical birth and Jesus said, You're, the only thing you need is, an, is another birth. And Jesus offered this Samaritan all the advantages of spiritual intimacy. He told her who he was and he brought her to faith in himself. You see, it was God's plan, it was Jesus' plan all along to save the Gentiles. Now I want to show you one more thing. Turn to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4, because we've got to understand how hard this is, what a big deal this is, that Christ's plan is to offer the gospel to the whole world. In Luke 4, Jesus is preaching in Nazareth. And in Nazareth, uh, he stands up in the synagogue. He reads from the Isaiah scroll. And, and everybody loves it. Everybody thinks this is wonderful. He's our boy. He, he grew up here. Everybody uh, thinks he's making us famous. You know, archaeologists have re recently speculated that there were only 50 houses in Nazareth. There were only 50 houses in Nazareth in the first century. So he comes from this muddy little obscure town and yet the people down in Jerusalem are thinking this man may be the Messiah. So he's making them famous and he's preaching in their church, in their synagogue. In Luke 4.22, it says they loved his sermon. All were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, isn't this Joseph's son? In other words, what they're saying is, Hey, I know Joseph. I remember Joseph. I know the family. I know this boy's family. So this man is making me great because my, I'm connected to his greatness because I know his family. He's from my town. He's from my neighborhood. The problem is he hasn't interpreted the sermon yet. He hasn't applied it. And what he does next is he tells them about two prophets who were also from, if not Galilee, at least near Galilee. Two prophets of the northern kingdom who were actually the two most famous prophets in the history of Israel. He tells them about Elijah and he tells them about Elisha. And he tells them stories that they know. They've read the stories. Even though they knew the stories and they'd heard the stories, they really didn't understand the stories. They didn't see the implication of the stories, that is, what the stories really meant, and they didn't see the application of the stories, how the stories were supposed to change them. And the two stories Jesus told were first the story about how Elijah saved a woman who was going to die of starvation and thirst because there was a, a, a famine in Israel. Nobody had any food. And Elijah goes to this woman's house and provides food for her and, and saves her. It says in verse 25, Luke 4, 25, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and a great fa famine came upon all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them. Here's what he said. He said, think of all the Jewish widows who were starving to death. But Elijah did not go to a Jewish widow's house. Elijah went only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon. That's Phoenicia. That's where the Philistines used to live to a woman who was a widow. In other words, he went to stay with a Gentile widow and he saved a Gentile widow. The Jews weren't saved. A Gentile was saved. 
And he, then he says, there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, but none of them was cleansed. The uh, leprosy was a terminal illness in Israel. If you had leprosy, you were going to die, and you were going to die slowly, and it was not going to be pretty. Elisha had the power to heal. Think of all the Jewish lepers who needed healing, but Jesus reminds them of what the Bible says in 2 Kings. Elisha didn't go to heal a Jewish leper. Elisha went and healed a Syrian leper, a general in Syria's army, and Syria's army was a great threat to Israel. All Jesus did was point that out. They knew the stories, the stories were in the Bible, but he retold the stories in such a way as to say, hey, it was the Gentile who was saved, not the Jew. There were other prophets who came from this neighborhood besides me. There was a prophet called Elijah. What did he do? He saved the Gentile, not the Jew. There was a prophet from up here in our neighborhood also besides me called Elisha. What did Elisha do? He saved the Gentile, not the Jew. When he told them that, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. It says in verse 28 that they were filled with rage, and it says in verse 29 that they led him to the top of the hill on which their city had been built because they wanted to throw him off the cliff. Verse 30 says that supernaturally he escaped from them. Oh, he was going to let them kill him. That's the whole reason he came, but not that day. It wasn't time to die yet. So you've got to understand the mindset of these people. You're reminding us that in the Old Testament, God sometimes saved the Gentiles? You know what we're going to do for reminding us? We, you know what we're going to do to you for reminding us of that? We're going to kill you. This was a big deal to them. This was not an easy thing for them to hear. And for Jesus to remind them again, and it's the very last thing he said, you know, you're going to be my witnesses through the whole world. You're going to be wit my witnesses to uh, the Gentiles. But listen, this has always been God's plan. The whole reason for the, the Jews being born, the whole reason that they would be raised up was so that they might be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's what God promised Abraham from the beginning, Abram from the beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Well, do you think the Jews were going to bless the earth by saying, we're going to go to heaven, but you're going to go to hell. Isn't that a great blessing for you to know? That's not what God intended for the Jews. It says in Deuteronomy that they were to be a kingdom of priests. That they were to be a light to the nations, to bring the nations to the truth. But they hadn't done that. They'd been very satisfied that they had the oracles of God. They had the temple. They had the sacrifices. They had the prophets. They had the law, and the Gentiles didn't. So they were going to be exalted by God, and the Gentiles were going to be shut out of the kingdom in a place of darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that was just fine with the Jews. And Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, the King of the Jews, said, Oh, no, 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 it's not going to be like that at all. When the Samaritans realized who he was in John chapter 4, they didn't call him the Messiah of Israel because the people in Israel hated them. They didn't call him the Messiah of Israel. They called him the Savior of the world because he is. And when he commissioned his disciples at the end of Matthew, he says, you're going to make disciples of all nations. And when he commissions them again, just before he rises off the, the planet, he says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the whole world. The uttermost part of the earth. 
Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Now, there is, um, there is what I called in Acts 1-8 um, both a prophecy and a promise. Jesus says, uh, you shall be my witnesses. Remember in Luke chapter 5, he says, I will make you to be fishers of men. I will make you to do something that you don't know how to do. The, the first thing Jesus had to teach his disciples was that they didn't know how to do what they already thought they knew how to do. They didn't even know how to be fishermen of fish, much less fishermen of men. So that in Luke chapter 5, when he's calling his disciples, they come in and they haven't caught anything. And he says, go back out there and let down your nets. And in John 21, after he's already risen from the dead, the same thing is happening. They fish all night, but they haven't caught anything. He says, let your nets on the other side of the boat, John 21. So he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So what's the first thing we need to do if we're going to be witnesses? To go out and be missionaries? No, to follow Jesus. We follow Jesus and He will make us His witnesses. He will make us fishers of men. Now, let me tell you a great secret that almost nobody knows but me. Are you ready for this? Jesus says in Luke 5, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus says in Acts 1, 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost part of the earth. Here's the great secret. Are you ready for this? Fish don't want to be caught. Did you know that? Fish don't want to be caught. That's why you've got to catch them. If they wanted to be caught, you wouldn't have to catch them. They would just jump in the boat. You wouldn't even need a net. So here's what this means. You will be resisted. You will be resisted. Um, it says, Jesus says, that the time will come when they will kill you and think that they're doing God a, a favor. And in Matthew 24, that prophetic passage, he says very casually, they will kill you. They will kill you. You know, sometimes you kill the fish and sometimes they kill you. Sometimes you catch the fish. We don't kill fish. We catch fish to make them alive. So it's not going to be an easy thing. There's a man standing in front of Jesus in Acts 1 who will soon be dead. His name is James. By Acts 12, he will be dead because he was a faithful witness. But you know what? We're all going to die anyway. The question, are we going to die doing God's will or hiding from God's will? Either way, we'll be dead. We'll either die having been a faithful witness or we'll die having been an unfaithful witness. But die we surely will unless we're alive when Jesus comes. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.